Aloha, everyone. Hola. Beware. <laughs> so what, Vika? That's a cup. I haven't seen some of you for a while. We hope everyone is well and warm and cozy. Looking forward to sharing hearts and mindfulness together. So I'm sure you know the team, Manda helping and hosting and uh, Pari, who just finished a, a retreat um, with a Burmese, Burmese lineage Canadian monk. And uh, she'll give a talk today. And Darine, you know, she's gonna lead the meditation. Um, and Jake, Jake and I are just going to be in, the, you know, cheer everybody <laughs> on. So we have. We have our world Sangha. Kyoto and New South Wales and New York, British Columbia, Oregon, California, Hawaii, Maui. <laughs> Whenever you feel ready, Darine. Welcome, everyone. And so, so happy to see you. And I can't believe that I always get nervous, <laughs> no matter what. So how about if we just start together um, taking a few deep breaths, if possible, all the way down to the belly. And perhaps feeling the support of the earth as is touching the feet. Or seat bones or whatever place in your body that is connecting to the earth. Feeling the support and perhaps attention starts to settle, riding in the body gently. receiving physical sensations, whatever is most obvious for you right now.
perceiving sounds as vibration textures. Pleasant sounds, unpleasant sounds, neither pleasant or unpleasant. Just receiving them as they come and go by themselves. Noticing emotions and feeling the correspondence in the body as physical sensations, perhaps heat, cold, tightness relaxation, heaviness, lightness, whatever it is, without trying to control or fix, manipulate, We're trying our best to receive them just as they are, whether they are pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. We do the same with the breath, receiving the rising movement as sensation. Just as the rising movement is happening. Falling movement of the breath, connecting with the sensations. Perhaps there's some thoughts, body sensations, sounds. Noticing them, receiving them, including phenomena as it arises back to the breath just letting it be as it is breath breathing itself See if 
attention can just relax a little bit even more there. Connecting and sustaining the attention. With sensations. As they are changing. Connecting and sustaining, perhaps, with their beginning, middle, and end. Seeing nature. Life as it is, constantly changing. Remembering that we can call up meta and conditional laws, karuna, compassion, unconditional compassion, mudita, joy. or equanimity as we relate and receive, hold, connect with experience. And perhaps there is this quiet abiding, quiet heart, mind, doing nothing, letting things be just as they are. knowing that we can always go back to our neutral anchor. To rest, stabilize the heart mind. As is receiving the flow of life. And at times we can go open up the attention and explore. Sounds, taste, smell. Noticing thinking. Even feeling appreciation for the capacity to think. And 
and even like its protection in the sense that it's a safety place for us. And just acknowledging that and perhaps appreciating its function. Thank you, Darine, for a very clear and uh, a very, very gentle uh, guided meditation. And um, yes, it, it really helped me ground it, <laughs> for sure. Um, just because, you know, the mind tends to be quite excited when it has to be doing something it's not quite used to, like uh, give it a talk. Uh, on Zoom. So this is actually my first time. And um, yeah, I'm just reflecting. You know, um, just as Stephen was saying, um, uh, that some of you may have just sat an online retreat with uh, himself and Darine, which I think it just ended yesterday. Um, didn't it? And I myself had just also come out of another online retreat as well. It ended last Sunday, as Stephen mentioned. And I'm sure a lot of you um, have had this experience of um, 
online Zoom retreat and um, practicing at home. Well, thanks to the pandemic, a home retreat and day sits um, have become somewhat a norm for us all. Um, and even though it is quite uh, different from in-person retreats at meditation centers that we used to, I find that it can be an opportunity to explore the practice in the comfort of our own home. Now, how wonderful is that? Hmm. And um, when we practice at home on our own, what may be useful is perhaps to pick uh, an aspect or two of the teaching that is applicable to daily life and explore as we go about our daily routines and you know, engage with people around us. This can help maintain the continuity um, in our practice. So I'd been reflecting and just thinking, you know, what aspects of the teaching that, um, you know, would be appropriate to share. And, um, you know, one came up um, and I'd like to share with you today, um, which is the um, clear comprehension. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept. You know, as we practice mindfulness meditation, there is an aspect of wisdom, the intuitive processing factor that associate with mindfulness. This is referred to, as I mentioned earlier, as clear comprehension or sampachanya in Pali language. It is what helps us understand the raw data gathered by bare awareness of mindfulness. It's the understanding not through thinking nor logical reasoning, but through direct experience. You know, as Darine had guided um, in her guided meditation. And so there are several aspects and degrees of clear comprehension mentioned in the Buddhist texts, but you know, for our purpose today, uh, in a context of home practice, well, let's explore a couple of um, aspects of this clear comprehension that are applicable as we engage in life outside of retreat settings. This uh, clear comprehension of our action or um, of what we do and clear comprehension of the suitability or appropriateness of our action. Um, so let's briefly explore <clears throat> this first aspect. In a clear comprehension of purpose, it simply means a clear understanding of reasoning behind what we do. Now, as we go about our daily lives, you know, how often are we actually aware of what we're doing? How much, <clears throat> excuse me, how much of our activity, you know, actually carried out uh, on a cruise control or, or autopilot mode? Yes, you know, things get accomplished in most cases, but when we're fully aware of what we're doing, and have a clear idea of its purpose, of the reason why we're doing it. We can be more deliberate and more efficient 
in our action and in the way we interact with people around us. Now, in daily life, most basic mindfulness practice that we can cultivate is to get in touch with how the body feels at a given time in the present moment. Uh, for example, while sitting in a chair, can we just drop in to actually feel what sitting feels like? It's that simple. And the same goes for when we're getting up, when we're walking around, um, doing our chores, you know, any of these other activities. It's just from time to time, can we just drop in to really feel what these activities actually feels like in the body? At times, we may notice also that there's an interconnection between the movements of the body and the, uh, and the motivation in the mind. Working together, these are basic components of our action. But under, and, um, sorry, understanding this is not an end in itself. Clear comprehension of purpose takes us a step further. It means to pause and to lightly reflect on the intention that lies beneath our actions. You'd be surprised that more often than not, what we really wish for is not that apparent. And not being aware of this may result in a very different outcome from what we want. Um, I'd just like to give you a little example. Um, one summer, um, many, many years ago, uh, my sister and her daughter, my niece, um, came for a visit from Thailand. And I was really excited, you know, when they arrived. I had all these plans, you know, for fun things to do and places to take them in and around Vancouver, like the aquarium or suspension bridge or, you know, even out kayaking, you know, it could be so much fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but at that time, um, my niece was in that, um, you know, awkward stage of preteen and just just being totally in her own world. And I must say with, uh, with quite a bit of rebelliousness as well. So I was, uh, I was quite disappointed when days after days, um, she just wanted to stay on a couch and play her, her computer game. Ah, yeah, we were able to drag her out. Um, most of the time, but, and to go to, you know, some places that I planned for. And we did have fun, but it was a struggle every time. And she was getting more resistant. And my sister and I was, of course, getting more frustrated as the days go by. And then around uh, midway, through that visit, I just kind of ask myself, what do I really want? Yeah, well, the obvious answer was, of course, to entertain them and so they enjoy themselves during their visit. But it was also obvious that how I went about it wasn't working. So, hmm. Yeah, the dynamic um, we were in did not result in much 
enjoyment for any of us. So then I kind of, you know, took a bit of time to explore a bit further. You know, just a little pause and drop in uh, just a light inquiry. And just kind of let it sit for a while. And what emerged was wasn't what I expected. Or, you know, like, yeah, it came as, you know, a bit of a surprise. Um, but it was quite clear, you know, there's some understanding that um, what I really wanted was, you know, just to connect with my niece. It's that simple. But I didn't see it. So that was an aha moment, which allowed a shift in how I was with her. She wanted to stay on a couch and play computer game. Well, I got on the couch and play the game with her. And we did have a lot of fun. And more importantly, was that uh, we felt more, way more connected. And she became more interested and more open uh, to explore what I had to offer. So in our daily lives, being clear in our purpose can be quite handy. It helps us act and relate with others in a more genuine and efficient way. But more importantly, in the context of Buddhist teachings, clear comprehension helps us operate within ethical framework in establishing and cultivating wholesomeness and to weaken and gradually shedding unwholesomeness in our thoughts and actions. It is this aspect of clear comprehension of purpose that helps us distinguish between the two. It means to honestly check whether the purpose of our intended action is wholesome or not. Namely, does it come from a place of generosity, of kindness, of wisdom? or from a place of selfishness, self-centeredness, a place of ill will, of malice, or from a place of insensitivity, of ignorance. Clear comprehension of purpose also means to clearly understand the consequences of our action, whether what we do would result in harm and suffering, or helpful and foster happiness in ourselves and others. It works as our inner compass, which helps guides us in our daily life. And on a deeper level, for all of us who come into the meditation practice, the question we may ask ourselves is, what is our purpose, our intention? Why do we meditate? Is it to reduce stress or maybe to develop some concentration so we can be more focused and efficient with our work or our life and our study? Is it to be more kind and compassionate to ourselves and others? Or is it to help us cope with emotional or physical pain. 
And of course, all these reasons are totally valid and wholesome. And at the deepest level, it is our wish to be happy, isn't it? You know, to have peace and harmony in our inner and outer world. Whether we are aware of it or not, we're drawn into spiritual practice to fulfill these higher purposes. So it is useful, it is important to recognize, acknowledge, and clearly see it. Because this can nourish, inspire, and strengthen our practice, especially when we meet with difficulties in our lives and in our practice. Now, clear comprehension to these higher aspirations also means to discern whether our action aligns with and conducive to progress in our spiritual quest or not. I was once told a story about an elderly woman um, who lives in Sri Lanka. She was a very devoted metta meditator. Um, and for decades, she practiced loving kindness meditation diligently every morning. Yeah, she would go, may I be happy? May I be peaceful? May all beings be happy. May all beings be peaceful. May they be free from harm. Every morning she meditated. And when she finished with her um, sit, she would get up uh, from her cushion and often um, she went around to survey her fruit garden. And there, um, there were several workers tending her garden. More often than not though, she would find fault in what they were doing and scolding and cursing at them for not doing the job properly. So, um, you know, how helpful is that, um, you know, to the work of cultivating a loving and peaceful mind? And what about her wish for others? to be free from harm. <clears throat> now, let's move on to uh, the second aspect of clear comprehension, a clear comprehension of suitability uh, of our action. Uh, this takes us a step further. So even if the purpose of our action is coming from a wholesome intention, this second aspect of clear comprehension provided an added dimension of appropriateness. Further consideration is to discern whether it is the right time and place to carry out our activity? And is it an appropriate thing to do under a particular circumstance or situation that we're in? This is what is meant by clear comprehension of suitability or appropriateness in our action. Now, Take, a, uh, take gossips for example. Let's say um, there's a story that is trending, um, a scandal um, about 
a hot young singer uh, who is, you know, getting himself in trouble again. Yeah. That dude. Yeah. So even if the information was true, we can ask ourselves though, would it serve any useful purpose to retweet or to engage in such conversation? How likely would it be beneficial to our followers or our conversation partner? If anything, it could provoke some unwholesome thoughts like judgment or resentment or contempt which potentially can bring some agitation to our own mind and in others as well. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, just check how the mind feels the next time this opportunity or this type of conversation comes up. It can be quite interesting. And um, let's say in a different scenario, um, let's take a different scenario. Um, say the information is true and clearly beneficial. F further conversation, um, whether it is the right time and place to say it can be useful. Um, my teacher, Siado Uvivekananda, once gave an example about giving a Dhamma talk. You know, even though clearing, um, sharing Dhamma is clearly a wholesome activity. But if he gives a talk at midnight, it's not a good timing. And to give it at midnight in a nightclub is clearly not an appropriate thing to do. Well, for one, um, it's usually so loud in there, right? And um, and people are probably less likely to be in receptive mode. And um, it definitely definitely would not be appropriate since um, he's a monk, and you know, a monk is not supposed to be in the club in the first place. So, uh, yeah, we just, you know, there's that little consideration here and there that we have to kind of bring in um, just to assess, um, you know, how, you know, whether it's appropriate or not, and, um, you know, to carry out the um, activity or not. And now let's take a, um, a look at um, uh, appropriateness um, or yeah in 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 just in the context of meditation practice another aspect of clear comprehension of suitability can be referred to as flexibility and balance in our practice it means from time to time to assess you know, where we're at in our meditation, how it's going um, and, you know, uh, which type of meditation or technique is suited to our situation at a given time. And yes, and so for example, you know, when there's agitation or aversion in the mind, we can just make a pause, you know, just feel that quality of mind. And then out of an intention not to cultivate it, we can gently, you know, gently, gently incline the mind to the practice of loving kindness or compassion. This can help, um, softens the edges and, you know, bring some 
maybe you know help bring more calm to the mind when there's lots of distraction when the mind scattered in so many different directions the practice of anchoring is just to rest attention in the sitting posture or in the body as a whole can help settle the mind. Or perhaps when there's restlessness, when the mind is just about to explode. Um, you know, just, you know, sometimes just opening up the field of awareness to kind of extend it outside of ourselves. You know, to sounds or sights for a while can be helpful. It's like, it's like riding a bicycle. You know, we make subtle adjustments here and there to keep the balance as we ride along. And of course, when the ride is smooth and when the mind is sharp and alert and there's balance between energy and stillness, there's not much to be done. We just stay the course, stay tuned in the present moment and let the practice unfold naturally. Clear comprehension of suitability in this regard helps us assess how the practice is going at a given time. And to use skillful means to make adjustments to help us practice in a balanced way. <clears throat> so there you go. Just a couple of um, aspects of clear comprehension um, that we could um, adapt and use in our um, home practice. And I hope that uh, you find it useful. You know, these two aspects are uh, to clearly recognize the purpose, the motivation behind what we do, and also to clearly see the suitability or appropriateness of our action. These aspects can be helpful to keep in the mind. You know, just to bring into consideration from time to time as we go about our daily lives and in our practice. It is an invitation to explore with gentleness and curiosity and to have some fun with the exploration and with what you find. I'd like to end um, the talk with a quote. I received a few days ago from uh, Ted, the Cyber Sangha. I'm sure you know some of you, um, you know, were on this mailing list and have already seen this quote. And you know, I just find it. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> it will be you know good ending for my talk. It is a quote from a Jan Tanisaro Bhikkhu, um, an American monk in the Thai forest tradition. He wrote, the key to maintaining your inspiration in the day-to-day -day work of meditation practice is to approach it as play, a happy opportunity to master practical skills, to raise questions, experiment, and explore. 
Well, thank you so much for your attention. And um, let us sit together for a few moments. Now, I think we have a little bit of time for uh, questions or comments you may have um, of you know, Darine's instruction or my talk or about your own practice. So the floor is open. Just raise your hands if you have, um, if you'd like to uh, to share or to ask questions. And you can raise your hands by um, just click on the reaction button, I think, so we could uh, we can see because there's three screens here. Um, so, yeah. Hi, Apari. Hi. Can you hear me? This is David. It's great, it's yes. great to see you. Great to see you too, David. Um, thank you so much for your talk tonight. Um, and what I particularly related to, and I think I heard, was that, especially the story about your sister and your niece, um, and how at, at some point during the visit, you gave yourself space to reflect without being reactive. And that's when the wisdom um, kind of came to you. Is that, I mean, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, and you put it way better than, than what I did. <laughs> So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it's, it is the space. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes.
Hi, Perry. Hi, Linda. It's good to see you too. Um, let me see, I want to find your picture though. I'm here. Uh, yeah, I have to find you because then I feel like I'm talking to you. Um, anyhow, uh, what, I, what I'm wanting to talk about is it, it, I, I, in the past few days, a huge amount of sadness and grief has been arising. Mm. And um, I think I think a lot of it, I mean, I can tell a story of what it feels like right now and what it is, but I think it's much deeper than what the story I could go into. And, and I just want to be able to work with this in, in a way that really gets to not make it go away, but to really explore this in, in the deepest way possible, because I'm almost, today I was almost depressed and I'm not, a, I don't get depressed and, um, you know, I can, feel this it, it's like a, a big like waking up with almost dread or or deep sadness a mixture I think in my chest and um yeah I just I'd like mm -hmm. some help working with this a bit a bit more mm -hmm. and has it been going um on for quite a while for you now or like how oh, how long has it been? Maybe four days. But mm -hmm. but I definitely noticed today. I just felt such low energy and and depressed and and um, yeah, mm. quite a sense of loneliness. And I think it's more an existential than actual in the life now. So the, the, what really is arising as the story is, is right now I, I do not have a, a partner and, and somehow deep sorrows arising about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, it's more than that. It's yes, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's usually is, you know, something um, much, much deeper and, you know, sometimes it's uh, it's not the kind of thing that we could, you know, as I was saying in my talk, um, some something that we could, um, you know, like figuring out um, through, you know, like thinking about it or logically kind of, you know, trying to reason it. So, um, and... Um, I think what is important is, you know, like um, as David was uh, beautifully um, reframe what I was saying, um, you know, to give it a, a space, you know, and just just let it emerge with with no agenda, just like and um, and of course, you know, with with kindness, with compassion. We just hold that feelings of, you know, like that loneliness um, with tenderness and with care. You know, whether we, you're going to find, you know, like the answer or not, it is being held, you know, with love. Um, and um, the answer may or may not emerge. And that is okay. You know, it is okay to, um, you know, to have this feeling of um, loneliness, of sadness. It's part of our human psyche. Um, and also to know and to notice, you know, like, um, you know, 
when it's not there, you know, because I'm sure, you know, with, within these past four days, it comes and goes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, sometimes just noticing when it's not there can be, you know, quite, um, quite a wonderful rest. And just to notice, okay, well, that's, you know, there's this loneliness and there's this, you know, sometimes there could even be joy, yeah. you know, within that period. So sometimes um, it could be useful um, to pay attention to that too, because then we know that um, there's both in our life and yeah. we can, yeah, and, and we can um, kind of, you know, um, pay attention to, to the other side as well. Um, this is, you know, this is what I could think of. And um, please, if uh, Stephen or Jake or Darine um, have other comments, you know, please, <laughs> please jump in. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel like you named it already, Linda, when, when you spoke of feeling the compression in your chest, uh, just ap applying the clear comprehension that Pari just spoke of in her talk, w what do you want right now? And what's appropriate to do? And, and then approach, well, I wanna feel, because I'm hearing you, wanting to understand the, this existential mood or this loneliness or depression. So, uh, so I feel like you touched it when you indicated you, you felt this compression or pressure in your chest and that knowing what you want is to feel the feeling is to start right there with sort of parking your awareness there and feeling that pressure and then what the, and then what happens to it and, and then does anything change do you feel more of that uh, isolation and loneliness and depression is that another sensation somewhere else in the body and just sort of keeping it grounded keeping it anchored keeping it in the moment i think you're wise and already knowing what's appropriate by not going into this story because the story can just in, in a way defend against feeling those feelings yes my my tendency too is to distract myself or start doing breathing exercises or right go out for a walk or I mean all those things are good things but yes, yes I, I think you're right to just stay with it when it's there and that's right or, yeah. yeah thank you thank you Pari and thank you Stephen thank you're you welcome. Ed? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> so Pari, as you were giving your talk, um, our house was attacked by monkeys. And uh, I don't mean uh, like monkey mind, but literally monkeys <laughs> came. And uh, we're running on the roof and then out on the bamboo and um, around our house we have some you know, we, we grow some vegetables and we have some peas, which we planted in October or November. And they're just coming up and we've, you know, we the little seeds and they were so vulnerable. Bridget planted them and then we had a greenhouse and we put them where we've been tending them for months. And we know that those monkeys, they want the tender shoots of the peas that are growing. And then when they, they pull those off, the peas die and we'll never get the peas <laughs> after months of 
taken care of. They're kind of like our children in a way, <laughs> even though we eat them. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, as soon as I heard the, the monkeys, it was like, oh, up and then out. And then I ran out the door and grabbed a rock, which <laughs> is my habit and kind of like, where are they? To scare them away and really like, you know, it's uh, it, where is it? Where are they? And it was, it's a very, it gets, when the monkeys come, it's a very uh, atavistic sense of us against them. <clears throat> and, um, I don't know what the question is. Um, it's really just kind of like, you know, I was sitting on my cushion, uh, being aware of my body and my breath and listening to your talk about clear comprehension and then <laughs> bam, <laughs> the whole thing went into a kind of, uh, fight the idea, you know, the need to protect and to fight against. And, um, so if you could say something in response to that. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, that's so hilarious. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, well, first thing is clear comprehension, isn't it? <laughs> you know, to, you know, just clearly knowing, you know, what's going on, you know, around you. I mean, that's what's happening. And also, you know, like to check, you know, what's going on within you too, you know, like all this, um, you know, thoughts and intentions and, you know, um, yeah, so, uh, what can we do? I mean, like we are living in the, you know, in the, um, you know, you were living our lives and, you know, things happen. <laughs> um, and I must say, you know, like it's probably not common um, to most of us, but um, it's unique um, situation for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just, yeah, to notice it, to, <clears throat> to notice, you know, the urge to, you know, to protect, you know. So may the shoots be happy. May they be free from monkeys. <laughs> may the monkeys be contented and go somewhere else, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, just to have fun with it, um, you know, because this is the situation we're in, right? And uh, <clears throat> and uh, did you throw the rock? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so that's clear comprehension there too. <laughs> so. I don't, I don't know what else to say if, you know, my colleagues have, you know, any other comments? Are you able to protect uh, the shoots with some kind of screening or fencing? That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> trying to figure that out, yeah. I have a monkey problem once in a while. When I go to this uh, island off uh, west coast of Thailand, um, and I don't have veg, I don't have a vegetable garden. Uh, I have a lot of coconut trees. They like to eat them, and then they drop on the roof and uh, hurt the roof and whatnot. Um, I'm always looking for a weapon. <laughs> of some sort. Uh, mostly I use my voice. I tell them, this is my house. You guys live over there on Monkey Hill, which is true. There's a hill there that's called Monkey Hill, and that's where they live. 
And uh, maybe 50% of the time after I'm there for a while, th that boundary is respected. They don't come, you know, this is my boundary, this is my place, this isn't your place. Uh, they come and they, they want shampoo or cosmetics or anything. If it, the poor person who leaves the door open in this, in this area, you know, they'll have their place trashed. I also use the water holes. It's not very strong. I wish it was a water cannon, but it would be kind of like um, um, refreshing. They get a bath, you know, not too harmful, but a lot of animals don't like water. You pour a bucket of water to stop a dog fight, you know, or to chase away uh, cats quarreling and whatnot. Mostly I have to just make things, make sure things are shut. When I leave the house and go up to eat or go out to the ocean to shut everything up, realize that the monkeys do live there um, and um, watch my mind, the irritation that comes up. <laughs> Someone gave me a slingshot, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I practiced for a while with little pebbles and I missed the target. So I gave up on the slingshot and I'd be afraid of, of hurting, of harming them anyway. <laughs> Jake, Darine, do you have any good ideas about working with monkeys? Uh, not monkeys, but where I am, we have chickens and we the hawks eat them. So we've created like a, a you know four wall fence with a screen on top. So that that's what I was thinking <coughs> of from a, <laughs> when you were talking about the pea shoots. I wasn't thinking about uh, clear comprehension. Well, maybe I was, but. <laughs> but not, not in not in Pali. I was thinking about fenced areas. <laughs> it works. That's good. Happy mm -hmm. for the chickens. Yeah, and you know another <clears throat> aspect of clear comprehension um, that's wise discernment, right? What's appropriate at a given time in a good even um, situation. So, you know, we have to do it you know, to protect our fruit and our shoots and, you know, whatnot. And, you know, just as, <clears throat> as Stephen um, was mentioning, just do it with a kind heart. So that's all. Well, well, <clears throat> what I noticed with the monkeys, because we have them come occasionally, not so often, but, you know, every couple of months, once a season they come and um, uh, always during a meditation sit. Huh? Always during a meditation session. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's every day. <laughs> um, Maybe they want to sit. <laughs> Maybe yeah. they want to practice with you. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, what I notice is it really it triggers a really like deep, primitive, atavistic, us against them kind of mind. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't really see, you know, when I'm in that mind, I, I don't see much other than the enemy and myself, right? Um, and I guess, like, how does, how do you deal with that mind? I don't have an answer to that, but I'm wondering, do you have lots of other opportunities or is this one of your few opportunities to get to explore that kind of mind? Oh, there's plenty of opportunities in daily life, but um, 
<laughs> yeah, for sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I guess this opportunity is the most uh, stark and maybe comic of all of the opportunities, right? <clears throat> That's kind of what I was thinking. Both starkness and comicness could could be really helpful in exploring that. Like, I just take it much more seriously when it's with a human being and and, and yeah. maybe not as stark. More more story, less primal us against them. This. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. I'd also suggest the same approach uh, in the discussion with Linda. Determining that you want to understand that mental quality, that mental state, that emotion. And then just making the space to feel it. It, it, it is an ancient primitive uh, um, genome force within, within our heart, within our mind, within our species. So, uh, so I mean, that too is in a way um, existential. You know, I mean, all that is happening in the present moment with the monkeys attacking, but the feelings coming up will vary depending on the person and the mood and the time and so forth. So when that comes up for you, if you want to understand it, that's, that's a clear comprehension of purpose. I want to understand, I want to understand this force, you know, that wants to protect or fight back or so forth. And then, and then stop the dialogue, feel the feeling. Where do you feel that mostly? Where is it in your body, in your throat or in your gut or all over your body, is it tense? You know, and then is this an appropriate time, you know, to do that? Or should you go out and stand by the peas for a while to make sure they don't get hurt? And then at another time, go back to that quality, that feeling. I mean, when it's up is the best time to deal with an emotion when it's there. making space for it, wanting to understand, uh, not blaming yourself, there's conditions for that emotion to come up. Uh, and the way we, we can't um, control it, but we can respond by wanting to understand. Thank you. <clears throat> I had some friends once at at the um, on that island. From friends were visiting from Australia, and uh, I was I was paddling in the ocean, and my friend Peter had come in from swimming and drying himself off. And then he saw the monkeys come to my place there. Uh, and so he, 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 tied, he tied the towel kind of around his neck and it was red. And he just started to run after the monkeys. He looked like Superman, you know, and he's kind of yelling and trying to be threatening to them. And I just saw him from the, my board out in the ocean there, just this flying cape and this form chasing these poor little monkeys, you know, scampering up coconut trees. It was, <laughs> it was really hilarious. <laughs> and it worked. I think it was something different the monkeys had never seen, you know, a, a Superman coming after them. <laughs> Sorry, I have to just add to that monkey story. Once I was, uh, uh, we were about to go, uh, <clears throat> the next day we were gonna go fly. Uh, I can't remember where. Anyway, we we're getting things ready and I was taking a shower and then going, went upstairs to where we were packing and I was drying myself off. And uh, there was a monkey on the roof just outside of the window. And I started like, what are you doing here? Why are you? And, you know, kind of like 
bellowing a bit because that's how you scare them away. Use a kind of deep male voice. And then, uh, and it was kind of looking at me and I was like, what are you looking at? And then I looked at myself completely naked. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you and I, we're buddies. <laughs> yeah, we're simian friends here. So. <laughs> That's a kind yeah, approach. Yeah. <laughs> a rare I'm moment of thought. <laughs> yeah. That's using bare awareness. So I see Sun with your hand up. But your volume isn't. We can't hear you. Uh, you had it for a moment. You unmuted, and then it looks like you muted once more. Try, try it again. Keep, keep trying, son. You muted yourself again. We can't hear. Did Amanda, Amanda, do they need you I to unmute? I tried them? to prompt. I don't know if I can unmute. I asked. Yeah, unmute. you can ask to unmute, right? Yeah. I, I did. There you go. Okay. Oh, perfect. Don't touch anything. <laughs> Now speak, son. <laughs> uh, I, this is interesting to hear about monkey business. <laughs> this reminds me of another. But um, I don't have any question. I, I guess I just touched something by accident. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate having the opportunity to see everyone, especially the teachers every week. Like before the COVID, we can see you and um, Michelle only like two or three times a year. <laughs> now we can see everyone every week, so it was nice. Yeah. It's, it's been one of, the, one of the blessings, the accessibility from geographical distances and lockdown boundaries and so forth. We've all been able to, to meet here. So even though sometimes we get zoomed out, bloomed out, it, there's a lot to be grateful for. So maybe after the COVID, when you have to travel again, you can travel again, we can still have Zoom. You can continue doing Zoom, yeah. <laughs> when you have, when you're not too tired from teaching, <laughs> maybe once a month. I suspect it would be a new form, some combination of, mm -hmm. of maybe going to some places um, and a hybrid retreat that's probably in place, probably um, virtual on Zoom. And then maybe Steve. the teacher's not always in the country uh, at the retreat center, uh, but people will be able to go to retreat centers and sit together and have yeah. that experience. And the, the teacher will be coming long distance from Zoom in some situations. I mean, I think this year has shown Michelle and I that it's the first time in 40 years that we haven't traveled every month or two. Mm. And it's been kind of nice that way. So Steve, are you able to get in the water to swim or paddle a little bit? Actually, since I came back to Honolulu, it, it hasn't been the best weather. It's often windy and rainy out here in East Oahu. So I haven't you know, been in- Alamoana, it's really nice if, if it's not good. Yeah, for luck, you can come to Alamoana. 
And then I have to really, try. It's really nice out here. Yeah. yeah, I'm working toward that. I don't like to leave. I'm happy here. I don't like to get in a 4,000 pound piece of metal and roll down the highways. I sneak around, get some food, you know, come back. In that way, this year of lockdown, shutdown, it sort of has trained my mind <laughs> you know, to not want to go out that much for walks, that sort of thing, or, you know, when the opportunity arises to get in the ocean. Yeah, on the big island, I was in the ocean a lot. Any other uh, inquiries about practice, Dhamma, or working, working with stuff coming up? Anyone else have a monkey problem? We all have emotions to work with. That's not a problem. It can be challenging, but we don't have to look for them. What's that time? We can't hear you. Yeah, lately I have a lot of nostalgia. So I try to watch my mind and you know, but it's it's not easy. Nostalgia is, is could be really hard. Yeah. I, I understand. Yes. Yeah, nostalgia can be difficult, but maybe sometime frame it as a frame it as to what kind of nostalgia. Sometimes it's a happy collection of memories and thoughts. Sometimes it's a sad collection of memories and emotions. And just, just to frame it as a way of using the clear comprehension again what do you want what do you want to feel is, is it a good time do you have the energy to, to feel it to investigate the nostalgic mind and how does a nostalgic mind how is it working in the moment good memories difficult memories both like just that kind of direct investigation in the investigation of the Dhamma. So you're, you're cultivating the awakening factor of investigation. Thank you, Steve, I will try that. Well, maybe that will be satisfying for the week. And we all have our work. We all have something to be aware of, to feel internally, externally, all around us, and can always cultivate loving kindness. This is always a good memory. I've taken, someone showed me how to take a snapshot of the screen so I have a few snapshots of Sunday sittings or past retreats. <clears throat> Provides a good, a good uh, palette, uh, a mosaic of memories. So that way we hold each other from week to week, from Sunday to Sunday, with kindness, with care, with joy.
but don't forget to appreciate everyone and to see everyone wherever they are in the world. British Columbia and Oregon and California and Arizona, Texas, different parts, different islands, so Hawaii. <laughs> Thanks for your talk, Pari. Thanks for the guidance, Darine. Hello, Kim in California. <laughs> Hello, Trey and Harry, Lowell, Fern, Fred, Phil, and Mark. And what's your beans name, Amanda? This is Maggie. Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Magnolia. Magnolia. <laughs> She's from Louisiana. <laughs> A good name to have if you're from Louisiana. Yeah. You know that J.J. Kale song, Magnolia? Look it up. No. Okay. <laughs> Mark on the Big Island. Oh. Did I see Angela? Angeli, I saw Angeli. Appeared and disappeared. <laughs> 